through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Drop it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows it frastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 232. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. In honor of the release of Dark Skies this mm -hmm. Friday, February 22nd, yes. we're going to be talking alien movies. Mm -hmm. You know, this is something that's been in Hollywood yeah. for decades and decades and decades yeah. at this point. You know, it's, it's sort of an evolving thing. Sometimes it's sort of like a metaphor for something else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just something to be scary. Yeah. Sometimes, I guess, they're nice like Paul. Yeah. Um, I, but, think, I think in the end they all in some way deal with that reaction to the other, the unknown mm -hmm. other yeah. that's either intrusive or subversive or just involved somehow. Yes. There's a lot of, you know, people like to project fear onto something and by making it not another human race, it makes it a little, or another part of the human race, it makes it a little easier to be identifiable, I think. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to start a ways back and talk one of the most classic examples mm -hmm. of uh, aliens in the history of Hollywood, and yes. that's Invasions of the Body Snatchers mm -hmm. uh, from 1956. Yes. Now, this is a story about a small town where one by one people are slowly being uh, replaced yes. by aliens. When they go to sleep, they that's when they I think they get replaced. That look identical to themselves, mm -hmm. so that you don't know that they're gone until they get you. Yep. <laughs> Okay. And very much like another film we won't be talking about that came many years later, They Live, uh, it's much more of a subversive, uh, slow conquering. It's well, not It's not about violence as much, or no. like, yeah, you know, true. taking over with with arms. It's more about the quiet, slow Well, there's, there's a reason behind that. Yes. I mean, obviously this is a representation of the communist which, uh, influence. Which is interesting, because I've always felt that. I was even taught that in school, that it was a direct allegory. But both Kevin McCarthy and author Jack Finney have always denied the belief that the story is a metaphor against McCarthyism and communism. Well, they saw it as a thriller. Don Siegel, however, believes that political references to Senator McCarthy and totalitarianism are inescapable, even though he personally tried not to emphasize them in the film. Well, I mean, see, it's one of those things that, you know, it could very well be sort of done in the in the story as mm -hmm. not just being a thriller. But yes. as soon as, if the director is framing it in the context that could be representative. No, I, I, I totally understand, and it totally makes sense to... Re to to compare it to it. It's just interesting, you know, it's easy for us in hindsight to say, oh, it's totally like a McCarthyism, but it's interesting to realize that even the people at the time, while that might have been a parallel that happened, weren't planning it. It mm -hmm. wasn't like the author sat down and was like, oh, McCarthyism, I'm going to write a movie about aliens. Like That stuff does happen, though, like uh, true. Bride of Frankenstein <laughs> yes. was written as sort of a way to circumvent all these, like, political laws and Mash stuff like that. being in Korea was because Vietnam War was too too real for people. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, it's definitely a classic film, one that's been done a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most interesting concepts of it... Uh, or, or sort of thoughts of it was uh, John Portanova actually mm, said mm -hmm. and that was sort of he imagined each film as sort of like a separate instance of it occurring as oh, opposed yeah. to like you know the same like one being remade exactly yeah and I thought what I th two remakes is the 70s one and then Invasion recently with Nicole at, Kidman and, at least yeah, yeah. There, there's like any number I think there might have been sequels and stuff too mm. it's just it's one of those things that's been done a numerous amount of times yes. and um, some of them good some of them not good <laughs> but you know it's, it's sort of that concept of it spreading which really sort of plays in to the concept of the film and yes. I, I think that's the scariest thing about it is sort of like you know the notion I mean there are other ones like Stepford Wipes is very mm -hmm. much of that same yeah, sort definitely. of idea that you know people are replaced yep. by sort of like a drone of mm -hmm. themselves that you know, yeah it isn't them but is and ugh creepy I, don't know, I, I mean I guess it sucks who wants to wake up next to someone who's not who they went to sleep with <laughs> That's true, but if they're like a nice, quiet version of themselves, that might be a positive thing. I'm just saying, you know, some people kind of like uh, on your grill. Like, you know, not, I hope this is not a representation of anyone you know. No, in it's life. not. It's not. It's not. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm sure there are cases where people yes. could be replaced by yes, yes. body snatchers or stepford yeah. wives or whatever, that it would be an improvement. Exactly. And, you know, with the whole Red Scare, whether or not it was meant or not, the, the fear very prevalent at the time was that there were these basically insurgents. You had spies, you had people that were posing as normal American citizens but were actually had an ulterior motive. I mean it's a scary notion though, like what do you what do you do in a situation like this? How do you escape these creatures? And, yeah. and I mean 
it is alien, but it's not really like, as you said, it's much more, I guess Dark Skies is sort of the same line. Mm -hmm. There are a few of them that we'll talk about that are sort of play down the yes. role of aliens where sort of like, you see the like sporadically like bits of them, mm -hmm. you see the influence of them, but it's still, you know, people ultimately that's scary. And that's, I mean, that's part of the reason that species yep. is unnerving was because they look just like this mm -hmm. and that. So, you yeah. know, it's, it's definitely and, creepy. you know, the femme fatale has been a popular trope since noir so yeah. a, a, if you have a, a very deadly lady who also happens to be a shape-changing alien that's uh that's pretty dangerous and it's funny to think about that this got nominated for nothing like i mean maybe it hit too close to home because of the politics around it mm -hmm. but you know this is such a classic film oh, i know it's, it's surprising that something yeah. like that would not do so you ever want to know what f a classic film noir looks like you should watch it because it uses all the visual elements of classic film noir Another film, though, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of decades later, we're going to jump to 1977, mm -hmm. and we're talking about Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Yes. This is the Steven Spielberg classic starring Richard Dreyfuss, mm -hmm. you know. And Francis Truffaut. I just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just love that when you look it up on IMDb, that's the, it's like, it is a that's great the cast. second like, name that is on there. Uh, he's a big part of it. Yeah. And, you know, like Terry Garr is a big part mm -hmm. of it as well. It's I mean, this is another one that sort of downplays, I guess, the role of aliens, and yeah. like, it's more sort of that sense that there's something out there yes. and yes. that all these people are trying to understand mm -hmm. and they feel something, you know. And it's not necessarily that they're like constantly being like harassed by aliens. Yeah. Like aliens aren't throwing rocks at exactly. their house and yeah. like, Psst, we're hey, out of here. Hey, hey. Yeah. <laughs> Come on down and have some fun. Mm -hmm. But, you know. But it does touch into another one of those things that becomes almost a trope in the alien or alien abduction style film, which is that there are some people out there that know about Mm. what's really going on and they can see kind of behind the veil and everyone else is relatively like you know because there's not physical obvious evidence well the, i think you're hitting on a couple elements number one i want to note that this is sort of a positive yes. representation of aliens yes. like they're not here to just kill us all mm -hmm. like they frequently are yeah, yeah um number two when you talk about that there are two levels there are the people who just sort of have an innate connection yes. to aliens like i don't know if it was they were abducted and they're brought back yeah. or whatever, yeah, whatever, whatever something whatever like that but there's be. also that element of like governmental conspiracy yes that they don't the want up. people to know about aliens mm -hmm. necessarily and the so Roswell uh, yeah. reaction. Yeah, essentially. I mean, this is definitely post Roswell. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess Body Snatchers. What was Roswell? Was probably like fifties or. I something? want to say Roswell was might have been like fifty three or fifty four. Okay. So it so might this, have been like this contemporarily a, Roswell. Yeah. But I mean, it's probably like too <laughs> yeah, recent yeah. to really yeah, I know. understand the extent of it. And this is like a couple of decades of that stuff percolating. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I, th I think this is really an interesting approach to the alien genre because you know it is. I mean, it's the positive note is almost in by itself completely weird because in the old pulp films, aliens like any were like any other type of monster. They were just mm -hmm. another thing to terrorize and scare humanity. Yeah. Like even with uh, Day the Earth Stood Still, even them being which are friendly well, but who, not. Like, who was it? Was it? Is either um, Stephen Hawk? I think it was Stephen Hawking who said, you know, if you just think about like the numbers mm. aspect of it. What do you think the odds that aliens are actually going to come here and not just want to wipe us out? Yeah, like it'd be it's it'd true. be naive to think that they wouldn't. Yeah, but you know, there's that small portion of like maybe they're more evolved society. I mean, they're. I mean, it's. It, I guess it depends on what you imagine aliens like, and true. that's one of the things that there's a whole variety of them mm -hmm. in this thing. I mean, they could be like alien, yes. which is a much more like eat your face kind of alien, <laughs> yeah. or they more could be predatory or much more intelligent, evolved. Well, this could. The, I mean, the ones in like this e. one are also more. Yeah, and, the, and E. T. as well are much more sort of like. I don't know, humanoid sort yeah. of type of aliens mm -hmm. where they're a lot more, more exploratory than they are conquering. But they're also much more like us. Yes. Like we can, yeah. we can sort of relate to them more because they sort of, I mean, they're not just like us. Yeah. They're not like body snatcher versions exactly. of us or something. But they're but much they're closer. Humanoid to the human and form. sort of they've yeah. got like arms and legs and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And we can sort of relate to them on a certain sort of level. And I mean, I think there's something. I mean, I don't know what we would do if we found aliens. Like, if we would be like, hey, come hang out come on the Earth. Or, yeah, probably. <laughs> probably. But there's there's an element of like... Or they probably do like one of the later films we'll talk about in this, yes. In this list. <laughs> yes. But, you know, it's sort, of, it's sort of that element of like, I would like to think that if we did... They send out those messages like, mm -hmm. 
like this is Earth, this yeah. is what we do, and sort of it'd be kind of interesting if aliens actually did that. Mm -hmm. Like the back thing, the to gold us. plate on the Voyager that's going out there that has yeah. all the information about humanity. Yeah, and this and this is sort of like their equivalent. Mm -hmm. Like you know, they're not just here to like anally probe us. <laughs> they're they're gonna you know <laughs> take us to their world and sort of experience mm -hmm. that. I, I think we spoke about this movie before when we did Spielberg, mm -hmm. but. Uh, I think it's interesting because it's another one of those movies that hits right in that cusp where special effects were changing and the mm. way they were done were so interesting. So two things that I find really interesting. One is that all the stars in the backgrounds of the night shots, as well as the many distant trees, hills, roads, and etc., were special effects and not real. Wow. All of them. This is even true in non-special effects shots, such as when Neri's truck is dr just driving along country roads. Isn't isn't this the one also that Spielberg gave Lucas part of the money for, like a portion of the receipts for, and oh. Lucas gave him part of the ones for Star Wars because they both thought mm. their films were gonna be like failures or something. like I, that? I forget, but I also do know that uh, the mother. This is gives me another reason to go back to the Smithsonian. The mothership is actually located in the Smithsonian. Wow. It's in yeah the Stephen F. Udzar Hazy Annex of the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. Final reason for me to go to the <laughs> south of the Dulles Airport in Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, visible on it are the miniature R2-D2, a mailbox, That's a cemetery, funny. and models of the airplanes that were abducted by the ship. Very the cool. reason R2-D2 is on there as well as I think there's um, a cut there might be there's a couple other things that are related to like Lucas and Spielberg they ran out of things for texturing for the ship so they just started finding other things so there's like an upside down R2-D2 and funny. something else yeah Let's jump a few years forward, yes. though, and go in a very dramatically different mm -hmm. direction with aliens. We mentioned it briefly, and mm -hmm. we're talking alien. Yes. This is the Ridley Scott, Sigourney Weaver classic, mm -hmm. about a, a crew aboard a ship mm -hmm. who get um, into a little uh, conflict with a species that has come aboard. Mm -hmm. um, it comes actually out of... One of them. Yes. Through the stomach. Chest burster. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's obviously gone on to influence <laughs> Hollywood in general yes. and create a whole lineage of them. You Thank know. you, H.R. Geiger. Yeah, His H. visual Geiger. style is pretty unique. But, I mean, you've got, like, what, four, three or four alien films? Yep. Four you know, movies, not counting the AVP Yeah, franchise. Alien versus Predator 1. So there's, there's a whole slew of them. You know, they've definitely changed as the series has gone on. And yes. the presence of the alien has dramatically increased mm -hmm. as people have become familiar with it. But the first one... The majority of it is sort of a thriller. You yeah. don't know what's going on. Very you know, little background music used. You know yeah. there's a creature. Mm -hmm. You know they're in a confined space. And you know that, like, it's killing them one by one. Yeah. Sort of like, was it Ten Little Indians or something like yeah. that? Yeah, Ridley Scott was very specific about trying not to show the alien face on because the front of its face was actually modeled on a human skull. Mm. And he didn't want it to look human as much as alien. So he mm. tried to have just glimpses and angles that made it seem creepy and, uh, you know which is totally did and this is totally that that not beginning but this is really when that the level of them of aliens just being a monster turns into aliens being a subject almost like of horror stories where mm. it's like they are predatory they are unreasonable they are not communicative they are just a creature out for death and they're also like Virtually indestructible. They spit acid. Like yeah, the blood like is heads acid. Heads within yeah. heads, you know. Which is interesting because it was the conceptual artist Ron Cobb who came up with the idea that the alien should bleed acid. Reason why is that da Dan O'Bannon, the writer, couldn't find any reason why the Nostromo crew wouldn't just shoot the aliens with guns. Mm. He was like, he was like, why wouldn't why wouldn't shooter, they? Yeah. And someone's like, well, what if their blood was acid? Says a conceptual artist. He's like, it's a great idea. So. Literally, acid blood put in there so that the aliens couldn't be shot with guns, which really does add a level of scariness, especially in the future. I mean, I think there's also an element of interesting about the the evolution of the alien with the movie. Yes. It starts sort of as, you know, a face sucker, mm -hmm. it sort of goes into the body, it sort of was a, like, kind of like a womb, gestates, gestates and, yeah. and then it comes out as like the creature that we've known mm -hmm. and fear The now. xenomorph. Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I, th I think the the indestructibility of it definitely goes up there. I mean, obviously there are other ones like, you know, Predator mm -hmm. that are up there in terms of like... Hence why they fought each other in yeah. the crossover franchise. But, I mean, in terms of like... Ruthless, indestructible... Oh, yeah. For focus killers, like, outside of like maybe Jason and those kind of killers, yeah. like... but it's that's probably... the thing. They're definitely up there with the horror villains. Like, they're, the aliens are... The aliens in Alien are so terrifying that they don't just become a conquest problem. They become like 
even one is something that everyone should be afraid of. And it sort of follows the sort of, you know, the arc of like the tr the, tr the cup first couple of Terminator movies. Mm -hmm. and that the first one was sort of a horror movie and mm -hmm. then it became more much action. Sort of action. Yeah. Like the second one, I mean, I, I mean, I don't like disagree with necessarily what James Cameron did with mm -hmm. the series because it's sort of like, what would I want in the second alien movie? More fucking aliens. Yeah. And that's what he did. He brought like the <laughs> game over, for, man. Yeah, game over. Exactly. Like, like, it, like, that's exactly what you want. You want to go to like the alien mm -hmm. planet, all this sort of stuff. And this is the kind of things that they start giving you. The series goes on. I mean, granted, sort of when three kind of went in a different direction, that was kind of a dis disappointment. You kill Newt, whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of unfortunate. I'll be but the, the three apologist. I, I mean, I think it's time. fine, but I think they shouldn't have killed Newt. I mean, it, it seems weird to like. Go to the trouble yeah. to save Newt, then yeah, immediately yeah. kill Newt before yeah. the third one. <laughs> Story <laughs> continuity. Yeah. But, you know, I, I mean, I, th I think, you know, for the most part, they're fun. I, the fourth one kind of grades on me. I mean, some people don't mind yeah, as much. Apologist yeah, apologist right here. But and we'll the, talk about the prequel, because it's dead to me. Yeah, well, the first couple, though, <laughs> Alien and Alien, yeah. I think are amazing films. Oh, and, totally. You know, I, I suspect if we were to run into Aliens, they probably would be much more like this than anything yes. else. I think it's interesting, because one of the things, you know, we always think of the Alien franchise, The Rise of Ripley. This, she's yeah. Yes. Always touted in like top five female oh, heroines. Like number one. Yeah, yeah, I know. I only say top five because people like to argue about who's better. Sure. But she's always in that top five no matter who is making that list. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's so fascinating about that is you think like, oh, like maybe that's just luck or chance. First off, Sigourney Weaver, uh, Ripley was supposed to be male originally or was going towards being cast as male because all the names of the main characters were changed during the revision of the original script by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Shusset. The script by O'Bannon and Shusset also had a clause indicating that all the characters are unisex so mm. they could be cast as male or female cool. actors. They never thought of casting Ripley as a female character, however, and mm. I think this is like the third role in Sigourney Weaver's career where she got a part that was originally supposed to be for a wow. male. So, I mean... Written in that you could be unisex, you want an interchangeability of all these people, so there's no real focus on gender, but out of that comes, even in that, your main character isn't thought to be female, and you have somebody coming out as female, and I think it's such an interesting... I mean, I think there's a few things that sort of crossed paths that worked out perfectly. Mm -hmm. A, you know, that they're so sort of open to unisex characters. Yeah. B, that Sigourney Weaver was so badass. And yeah. C, that Ridley Scott is a fan of strong female characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about like Thelma and Louise and other ones yeah, he's done. Yeah, totally. Um, so it's it's definitely, so I mean, Prometheus had a strong female yeah. lead as, as well. I mean, so you definitely have an, any number of strong females in his career as well. So there's sort of a merging of three major things. All yeah, it's just cool. I think it's just really, really neat that it was actually originally conceived with unisex. I mean, it makes sense. You're thinking future. You don't necessarily think yeah. gender norms still can exist on a yeah. random spaceship. It's true, it's true. Again, carrying over that sort of scary alien mm. sort of vibe, we're gonna go. I would say even a scarier alien oh, yeah. personally, and we're jumping just three it's years not forward. The, the scariest, alien. yeah. <laughs> and that is the thing. Ugh. We're talking John Carpenter, Kurt Russell here. Ugh. Story about uh, scientists in Antarctica mm -hmm. that stumble upon culturally relevant. Put it in the film registry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're working there. We're working there. Um, we've got a campaign on Facebook, mm -hmm. but Check you know, <laughs> we. Um, they stumble upon this like dog who yeah. was running away from I, I think, Norwegian Norwegian camp, mm -hmm. and you know it turns out the dog is like a shapeshifter, mm -hmm. and you know they can sort of mer like mimic different mm -hmm. people, and you know sort of like it's uh, it's got that element of being like sort of like the alien and alien. Yes, um, but, but also, also being like the aliens and in invasion of body structure. Yeah, so it can, it can not only kill you as it's normally is, mm -hmm. but as it becomes something that you don't realize yes. is an alien, and then it can easily sneak up on mm -hmm. you and kill you that way as well. Uh, I think it's interesting that, you know, I, we think, I think of this movie, you know, obviously we're, I f always forget that it's a remake of a mo The Thing from the Other World. Which from, is pretty good, actually. Yeah, and even the beginning intro, they recreated, that John Carpenter recreated the intro to The mm. Thing to match The Thing from the Other World. Uh, but... You know, we think you always think back, and obviously with John Carpenter, it's, we there's a lot of retro cult followings of his films that were, and some of them were really famous at the time, like Halloween, and some mm. of them weren't, but people loved them, like Big Trouble in Little China. Sure. This, entertainingly enough, this movie was a failure. Well, I mean, to be fair, this came out at the same time as E.T. Yes, which, it actually I mean, came out like a, like a week or two apart. Yeah, yeah like it, which is amazing to think about, just in the terms of A.L.A. movies, yeah. in terms of film history. But it's just mm -hmm. sort of like E.T. is like. Such, and we're not even gonna talk about it because yeah. it's like the the quintessential. Yeah. Everybody knows about it. Everyone mm -hmm. loves it. But sort of like, you know, 
it's you're gonna get completely overshadowed when exactly. you're doing you're going up against Spielberg, you're yep. going up against a more family friendly yep. film, you're going, you're going up against, against a that classic specific movie, film, yeah, which is like, so amazing. It's it's just really unfortunate circumstances. People are definitely much more apt to, I mean, family oriented mm -hmm. material. So, but but I mean, it's like you know, Carpenter gets so known sometimes in America for being like schlock fest, mm. at, but. According to John Carpenter in an interview, he takes all of his failed movies pretty hard, which is not surprising because he cares. But this one was the one that disappointed him the most and is also his favorite film of his that he did. Uh, not only was the movie a box office failure upon release, but both critics and audience, to his shock, to Carpenter's shock, panned all its, gore its gory effects and its bleak tone. And he was particularly upset when the original movie's director, uh, Christian Nyby, publicly denounced Carpenter's wow. version. That's Yet. Crazy. After all of that, and not only was it popular enough to get a prequel made of it in the last, what, two years, I think? It was 2011, maybe, that the thing prequel uh, came out? Of? Yes, 2011, so that's right. But in August 2003, a couple of hardcore fans, Todd Cameron and Steve Crawford, ventured to the remote filming location in Stewart, British Columbia. And after 21 years... 21 years, found remains of Outpost Number 31 wow, that's awesome. and the Norwegian helicopter. The rotor blade from the chopper now belongs to Todd and rests in his collection of memorabilia. But it's just so cool that they went to the trouble to actually, you know, film it. Oh, totally. There. I mean, or totally. at least part of it there. Yeah. Like, that's that's just amazing authenticity. Yeah, yeah I think the, it was ha half done in British Columbia and half done in L.A. sound stages, and they said to make the, the supreme cold... All of the sound stages were kept at were refrigerated to 40 degrees, and the area outside the sound stage was kept at a heat of 100 degrees, so that the difference would be so extreme that it would be like frost everywhere, not just kind of cold. I mean, I, I just gotta appreciate that sort of attention to detail. Oh God, yeah. One of the funniest things to me is that uh, you know it didn't really get nominated for much of anything, mm -hmm. but it did get nominated for a Razzie Award for worst musical score <laughs> by Neo Morricone. What? The guy from like a fistful of dollars, what? a few dollars more. Yeah, he got nominated for a Razzie for worst uh, score. All right, Razzies. Uh, you, you coming have, around to my side now? Uh, all right, Razzies. You and I have had a lot of agreements over yes. the years, but I gotta say that was stupid. <laughs> it's, it's like it's crazy, and you sort of like you listen to it now, and it's like classic yeah. music. Like, I mean, the fact that it's not done by Carpenter is amazing in itself because right. he usually does his own but, scores. I mean, you're picking like a dude who's one yeah. of the greatest <laughs> composers in the history of It's like if you gave a Razzie to John Williams. Yeah. I don't care what movie it for was yeah. for. It's John. Fucking yeah. Williams. I mean, I, I think if you're actually doing that nomination, you got to be like, okay, is my taste in music shitty? Yeah. Like, do, I, <laughs> do I not understand what it's supposed to do? Like, Seriously. Do you even, Come like, on. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's good that, you know, we screen this um, here locally mm -hmm. and we're big proponents for yes. it on the MacGuffin. It's one of those things that it's good to see, you know, people who have never seen this film oh, yeah. re watching. It still holds up very well. Oh, God. Well. Yeah. The special effects hold up. The, the horror of the film shows up. I mean, th I think uh, both John Carpenter and and Kurt Russell have said that they still, to this day, don't, can't say with efficiency when or who got changed, who got changed, yeah. and if so, when. Like, for the most part, they, you know. I like the well mystery. Done. Oh, yeah, same here. Let's jump forward another decade, go to 1996, and one of the most memorable films uh, of the last few decades in terms of, you know, trailers big oh, yeah. and big releases yeah. and all that stuff, and that is Independence Day. Independence Day. This Will Smith, Will Jeff Smith, Goldblum, classic Roland Emmerich, yeah, um, Dean Bill Devlin. Pullman, Bill, yes, you're no, right. Pullman. almost Paxton. No, no, it's I Pullman. Always, yeah. it's Pullman as the president. Yeah, story of you know this uh, is our Independence Day, <laughs> which was a line that was ad libbed because or put in later, not a part of his original speech, because the abbreviation ID4 was actually invented due to undisclosed legal problems long since resolved with the title Independence Day. And that line was put in to add oomph to that speech to convince 20th Century Fox that it should fight for it. That it should continue to fight for the name Independence Day in the hmm. title. That's cool. I mean this is a story of aliens coming to Earth, mm -hmm. you know Welcome to first Earth. The, I mean, not the first time. I guess there is some sort of like Roswell type yeah, stuff that yeah. there is a history of it. But basically, it's the first uh, experience of most people mm -hmm. with aliens. Yes. Most people large scale world conquest. Yes. You see, you, well, you see those initial group of people who are sort of interested in them. Like, what are these things hovering above mm -hmm. our cities? And then, as probably as reality what would happen, mm -hmm. they obliterate <laughs> yes. pretty much everyone, <laughs> yes. and we're forced to get like a ragtag army together mm -hmm. to fight them back. Mm -hmm. One thing I realized. Looking over this that I didn't remember from the film, hmm. it was two and a half hours long. Really? Yeah. 
153 really? minutes. Wow. Yeah. I guess that makes sense because if you think about There's like a the lot whole, that goes on. well, like the whole first 60 minutes is basically like the entire world being destroyed, being set up and then destroyed and then attempt, you know, attempting to move forward. I so. think this was one hmm. of the sort of turning point movies in terms of special effects. Yes. I mean, I think. I would agree. The, the memory of people have of like those iconic places, like you know the White House mm-hmm. and stuff like that, being, being destroyed. Blown up, Empire State Building was yeah. so well done yes. at the time that it, it was just like shocking to people mm-hmm. how believable it looked. Yeah, like and I think that really turned. And this is what 90, 96? Okay, so yeah, it was right. Like, CGI cusp is about to break. It really turned that sort of like <laughs> point at what at, of what had been done before. I mean, obviously there had been good stuff done before. Yes. As to like being able to do whatever we wanted mm-hmm. instead of just doing sporadically budget conscious kind of elements. To reinforce like that. that argument, it holds the record for the most miniature model work to appear in one film. Wow. It is said more miniatures were used for this film than any other two films combined. So, I mean, you're talking like you could take two Star Wars movies and this has more miniatures than it. Uh, due to the advances in digital talk technology since the film's release, most experts believe that that record is going to stand forever because why would anybody bother it, to make yeah. a bunch more? Like the mothership, the actual mothership, is in real life 65 feet long. That's pretty amazing. Like that's huge. That's ridiculous. But I mean, it's not probably a surprise then that it won an Academy Award totally. for visual effects. Oh, totally. Like, it, was, it really, it really, it was amazing to watch. Hindsight, of... hindsight criticism of the movie aside, the special effects still are really well. I mean, none of the fixed wing aircraft in the film were ever flown for any of the shots. So mm. every jet flying is special effects jet, fake jet. It's it's funny though. I mean, this is one of those films that was a lot of fun. It got so much flack for the end where we essentially beat the aliens with a computer virus on a Mac, which, which is the same sort of problem I had with a War of the Worlds. Yeah, where it's like they just got sick and died. Yeah, like it, Common it, cold. It, it felt it felt way too much. Like they got like, as much as I dislike the World of Worlds ending. At least that one makes more scientific sense that an alien species would not be used to influenza. But they which have is been the here prevent. for like decades before. But that. I'm saying dis- disease from another species to me makes more sense than. In sure. two alien races having compatible technology. Yeah, especially back then. Like, yeah, yeah. I think we're still working MacBook. on modems at MacBook. that point. Like, how do we patch that <laughs> yeah. MacBook? Like, yeah. do they have a BBS or something yeah, for yeah, that? Like, a, alien BBS that we could connect <laughs> yeah. to? It? Like, I don't a weird even... squiddly spooch that he plugs his converter into. Yeah, and it's makes... like, I, I mean, how do you how do you connect that? Like, does yeah, is AOL available for mm-hmm. the aliens as well? Send him like an email virus. Yeah, or this is in probably also the end of Gold Jeff Goldblum, young Goldblum as. Is in, yeah, in his awesome say. career because between this and Jurassic Park, he kind of peaked, and then yeah, I would agree. It's, I mean, it's, it's no surprise that the film got uh, nominated for a Razzie for worst written film over a hundred million dollar gross. <laughs> because welcome, of, welcome to Earth, man. Come I, on, I would honestly say probably up until the point that they have the virus, I'm on board with it. Yeah, like I think I, even the end is like as as weird and inexplicable as yes. it is. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, we have. The hologram copy of it yes. right in front of us back here, but uh, I mean it's it, like I'm totally on board with it yeah. until then, and and it's so much. It, it's a lot of fun. I mean, oh, totally. you know, I, still there, great, there, there, great there are film. even scenes where like, where's it? Randy Quaid flies the plane mm-hmm. up the, the yeah. up into the the ship to blow it up and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, um, Brent Spinner is the Spinner, doctor. Yeah. Uh, that whole scene with the with the the room going foggy and his body burst hitting against the window still startles me when I know it's coming. Yeah. I mean, some of the stuff's done really well. I also think it's interesting that the cre- the al- they people who wanted to make the alien effects they had two different designs that they were competing over. So in the end, what they did is they made one of them the spacesuit for the other. Mm. So they combined them both together. I, I mean, you got to give them credit for that. You also got to give a a lot of credit for. Picking Will Smith to be in this film. Yeah. I mean, you think about this. Men in it's Black true. didn't even come out to yeah. the next year. So this is probably really the breakthrough. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. Exactly. Fresh Prince and maybe six degrees of separation. Who who would have thought that um, he could be like a big time oh, action yeah. star, though? And I mean, he probably should be giving thanks every day to Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich for that because he is. I would say probably the most bankable star yeah. at this point in Hollywood. Yeah, it's like him and Tom Cruise can just high five their way to the bank at Scientology. I think I think he had the longest streak of like a hundred plus million dollar opening consecutively. He's, so I mean, and he's a great action star. Yeah, I mean, I think, I really think it's not it's not just like he's got undeserved success. He is very oh, no, he's, he's very, very charming. Yeah. He's very funny. He's very good at doing physical yeah, very, action. Very very versatile actor. Yeah, and that's what you need these yeah. days. Yeah. 
So, and it was sort of interesting. You have sort of a mix of like um, aliens in the physical form mm -hmm. versus them operating in their ships and yes. stuff like that. So it's sort of an interesting mix of aliens. Yep. Things. And this is, you know, one of the pro one of the more I as silly as it is, and as we just talked about it being, you know, worst written screenplay by the Razzies or whatever. Like, it still I think holds to this day one of the more realistic. Uh, reaction or like first contact type experiences, totally. which is that they'd, they'd show up a long time us. ago, learn a bunch of stuff about us, come back a bunch of years later with their entire force to just wipe us out and take our planet over. Yeah. Like, and who doesn't like seeing those awesome ships fly out of the clouds? Those were that was just yeah. those were some awesome it'd scenes. Be, it'd be a pretty crazy experience. Let's move forward though yes. to the aughts. Mm -hmm. The first one we're going to discuss is Signs. Yes, this is the M Night Shyamalan. Mm -hmm. I guess you'd call it a classic. I don't know. It's okay. Dep um, depending on your opinion of M. Night Shyamalan's films. Story about a small town that, um, small town family mm -hmm. that comes into contact with aliens as it sort of gradually becomes aware that the world is being yes. invaded by yes. aliens. It starts out sort of as a small um, invasion with mm -hmm. sort of glimpses on um, yeah. videotapes and stuff like that. Crop circles and stuff like that. Exactly. Right? And it gradually it sort of grows uh, until they sort of outright try and attack them, mm -hmm. I guess you would say. I mean... I think it'd be safe to say that. This was probably the last M. Night Shyamalan film that I really enjoyed. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't say I loved it as much as something like Unbreakable or mm -hmm. um, The Sixth Sense. Yeah, but this was definitely, like, I wouldn't say the turning point, but this was the area where people started to go, like, mm, with with his with his career. Like, yeah. I think Sixth Sense was obviously amazing. Unbreakable, even people who didn't like it, there was still enough about it that was solid that people were like, all right, this guy's going on. And, and I mean, I think it says something about that momentum because he insisted that the film posters be released without showing Mel Gibson's face as he considers it an ensemble piece and that it didn't refer to the Sixth Sense as it's a different movie and he didn't want that. Well, it's also I also think there's something interesting about this being the first film not included his, his original one with like Rosie O'Donnell or whatever oh, it was. Yeah. But this is his first film since he was really successful without mm -hmm. Bruce Willis. That's right. I mean, yeah. so that was a big, big step. I mean, Grant Mel Gibson was huge at this time yeah. still, but he like it was a big step to try something. Bubble. Yeah, to try someone new. And you know, I, I think for me the, the sort of problem with this film is like number one. I think I think it's very interesting the family. I think mm -hmm. that's really interesting the family dynamics. Nice have one the Fannings in it. Uh, yeah, Dakota. Yeah. Um, I think it's Dakota. Let me check. I think you're right. Uh, no, Abigail Breslin. Oh, okay. Yeah, wow. Damn, yeah. She's been around off. forever. Yeah. Um, and a Colkin in it, though. If that's any mm, consolation, mm -hmm, Rory. Mm -hmm. But you know, um, it's it's that you know. Number one, this is sort of the turning point where he started to ramp up his presence in the films. Yeah. Like as his films go on and on, he starts taking more larger roles and more important yes. roles for himself. Uh, it also sort of was the turning point where the writing started to drift a little bit. Like mm -hmm. I thought it was really creepy and stuff when the aliens were just sort of in the background. Yes. But then it has one of the most ridiculous concepts of aliens coming to a planet where water yes. is like 70% of the world. And water is and, like their one weakness. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. And the foreshadowing in this movie was so heavy handed with the like yes. swing away or whatever it was. Yes. That was just sort of like, it kind of, it kind of killed it for me ultimately, but you know, dog fight and scarecrow. Yeah. No, it's just between us. <laughs> I mean, I, I, th I think it's enjoyable. I like, I like, the, like the scenes where you see the cameras and the, the found footage of mm -hmm. like the aliens walking across alleys and stuff. Super creepy. Yes. But when they're sort of like, just you see hands and stuff in mm -hmm. the house. Super creepy. Um, when you see the daughter sort of following them yes. outside and stuff. Super creepy. Uh, I think it's interesting. You know, I, again, as I, I know you don't feel this way, but I do, I generally like, oh, this person was cast instead of this person. Big friggin' whoop. But um, I'm trying to remember, Gladiator would have been after this, right? Or was no, this it was before? before this. Okay, so Joaquin Phoenix had a pretty strong career yeah. at the time, but he actually replaced Mark Ruffalo, who was originally supposed to be really? in the film. Really? Huh. And the reason that Mark Ruffalo was pulled out of the film is because they thought he had a brain tumor. Wow. Turned out to be benign, but can you imagine, like, I, I, I won't insult Mark Ruffalo and say that he hasn't done anything worthwhile after this or in his career, but like just even for like more recent things we wouldn't have the good Hulk in the Avengers um, amongst other amazing things Ruffalo did if he actually Died. had a brain tumor. Yeah, It's just kind of crazy to realize. It's that. also sort of funny if you spin it the other way and think about like what he missed out on. Yes. 
And I mean, not that much. No. <laughs> like, it, it would have been like a modest film yeah. in his career, but really not like anything that yeah, remarkable. So, like, it wouldn't have made or broke uh, Mark Ruffalo yeah. as it didn't make or break Walking Phoenix. I, mean, I mean, I guess at the time to be in a M. Night Shyamalan movie was pretty cool. But, but this was probably, again, like we we're saying, the one where maybe that that was started, started to have less credibility and less weight behind it like oh i was in signs uh so what i mean <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely was a little bit on the downward yes. slope for sure yes we don't even talk about the village Oof. yeah i'm not i'm not gonna go there I've, I've, <laughs> yeah that's like that's like a traumatic <laughs> yeah. past event like i have ptsd or lady for in the that. water yeah <laughs> uh village is still the number one hit woman for me um no, let's jump forward and yes. talk a, a more sort of interesting spin, sort of a Close Encounters type one, mm-hmm. and that is in 2009, District, District 9. Nine. Mm-hmm. This is Neil Blomkamp sort of feature debut mm-hmm. about a South Africa where aliens are sort of there as... I don't like know refugees almost. Yeah, I mean it's it's not it's not necessarily like they're invading us yes. or we're fighting them. They're just sort of like cohabitating. Yeah, somewhere. And it was very much uh, not surprisingly based on apartheid. On, on apartheid yeah. and Neil Blomkamp's like actual experiences there. The title is a nod to an actual real place and real incident because District Six was a mixed race neighborhood of Cape Town in which the apartheid government demolished in 1966 to make room for whites. <laughs> so it was an actual area that they had said like you go there if you're not white that they were getting rid of to make more room for more whites it's interesting to think about just in a sort of context of like you think about we were talking about what we would do earlier if mm-hmm. we ran into them or they ran into us yes odds are that we'd probably try and wipe complete, them out <laughs> or they would wipe us out yeah and it's sort of weird to think about a scenario in which especially when they have like spaceships above us mm-hmm. that we're like you know, basically discriminating against yeah. them and like putting them in slums yeah, and sort it, of controlling them. Essentially, like, I think like District 9 is a great uh, visual representation of if an alien species that wasn't hell bent on conquest showed up in an emergency style situation, like almost the ag- exact opposite of Alien, where mm. it was like a crash landed ship to get rid of them. This is a, like they can almost crash land on Earth and they look at us for help and instead we totally subvert them and make them like yeah. a lesser. Like, we just shove them in a corner, and we're like, you stay over there, and we don't care about you no more. And, I mean, I think it's one of the most interesting sort of uh, transformations in any of these films, the one that Charlotte Copley's, mm-hmm. Charlotte Copley's mm-hmm. character goes on as he sort of becomes a an alien. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he sort of, not only does he sort of go from one of the leaders and trying to like keep them down mm-hmm. but he sort of experiences NNU, i think is what they're called yeah it goes through experiences what it's like to be one and mm-hmm. sort of like you know i mean talk about and I mean, if you're ever going to talk about the conversation of the other and you bring up apartheid it's like man you you discriminate against the other and then you become one and you try yeah. to rise up i mean that's who you could talk about that for a long time i think it's interesting that uh you know especially because this was i think neil blomkamp had only made like a halo short film that peter jackson saw mm. and then he took that and helped him produce and make this film. Yes. And part of the marketing campaign in North America and the United Kingdom for this film, posters were put up in major cities on bus stops, side of buildings. I remember, yeah. Everywhere, designating areas that were restricted for humans only with a number to call, 866-666-6001 in the U.S. and you know, the crazy one in the U.K. in order to report non-humans. Uh, the title That's of the funny. film was generally not included, although the URL address for the film's website was. I remember seeing those. Like, I didn't know anything about the movie. I remember just seeing those weird outline like report non-humans I th- yeah I think this was kind of amazing because you know it just it came out with a bang like I didn't oh, know what God, to yeah. expect with it like the story was awesome the visual effects were mm-hmm. amazing I still like, wish the they performance made it, make us, hope they make a sequel but. yeah I mean <laughs> District B13. <laughs> well, I mean, oh, wait, that's a different series. I mean, they did, they kind of, they set up for a sequel because uh, when the metal flower that uh, mm-hmm. he makes, that his wife ends up l- looking at at the end scene when she's looking at it behind her, you can see, because she's, I think, at a hospital or something, mm-hmm. you can see, um, uh, what is it, the, to test for pregnancy, the ultrasound. Oh, yeah. There's ultrasound images behind her that mm-hmm. show that she's pregnant. I mean, it's amazing to think, though, that this got nominated for Best Picture, Best totally Writing, Best edit- Achievement in Editing, Best oh, Achievement in Visual Effects. Mm-hmm. Like, it was it was an amazing first release mm-hmm. out there. I mean... I, the special effects were phenomenal. Yeah, they were great. This is one of those, like... This is one of the... I wouldn't say early, because when did this film come 2009. out? 2009. Okay, yes, yeah, so not early, but this is definitely solidifying the... You can do full digital 
uh, co-stars and characters and not have it be Jar Jar. Yeah. This was like really cementing home, like, check it out. Like, we can totally do it. No, and originally, it. one of the reasons that the, pra the prawns were big and hulking was, so, uh, in their original idea, they were big hulking aliens, was so that they could have people in suits and not have to deal with that. Mm. But then as, like, once Wingnut Productions shows up right. with their special effects team, you quickly do realize that you want. digital people yeah. are better than guys in suits. It's kind of <laughs> nice to have that option to do whatever yeah, you want. Seriously. Yeah. Sure. Let's move forward, though, mm -hmm. and talk about this Friday, yep. 22nd of February, Dark Skies. This is from director Scott Stewart, mm -hmm. stars Carrie Russell and Josh Hamilton as a family that sort of becomes, I don't know what you call it, harass, mm -hmm. stalked mm -hmm. by aliens. I think it's both good. Because of that, you know, various things start occurring. Like, there's migration of birds that mm -hmm. crashes into their house. They start to lose control of their limbs and stuff yes. like that as it sort of becomes the... I don't know. It's unclear whether the aliens are just testing on them mm -hmm. or they're going to just abduct them or mm. what exactly the plan is. Mysterious they happenings occur. They look sort of like humanoid-ish mm -hmm. from the brief glimpses you see in the trailers yes. and stuff. But they do look creepy in that they don't really give you good shots of them sort mm -hmm. of graphs sort or of like signs or yeah. something like that. Um, I think it's I think it's definitely interesting that it sort of goes veers into that sort of creepy alien vibe yes. and sort of probably again, you know, much more realistic in what they would actually do mm -hmm. if they came across Earth and that they'd yes. want to find out what our weaknesses are and then probably Eradicate us. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I love Carrie Russell. She's, mm -hmm. she's awesome. And um, been kicking butt lately in that show, The Americans. Getting a lot of. Good I haven't watched that yet, but I've, I've been looking forward mm -hmm. to it. And Josh Hamilton, I'm a huge fan of Dane Back to Kicking and Screaming, which is one of my oh, favorite comedies mm -hmm. probably of all time. I just love that movie. So <laughs> and he was great in Outsourced as well. So mm -hmm. it's gonna inter it's interesting to sort of see him take on a much more dark serious role. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, it looks like the visual effects are pretty cool. I will say that this film is not being screened for press so take that with a grain of salt and Usually. unfortunately it's also a february release mm. yeah well however it's only competition is snitch so yeah. take that yeah however you know there is always always the flip side of that which is uh n not only just like alien abduction style movies but like any kind of horror movie can always like break molds as far as being successful even if it's critically panned and comes out sure. at a bad time i mean people still like going and getting scared and so. it has a creepy jk simmons in it which i like jk simmons a lot yep. so that doesn't hurt at all jk simmons but. is great oh I, I think i might check it out i think there it looks interesting mm -hmm. it probably is terrible but it at least <laughs> looks interesting so i think for it, people, fans of the alien film and the I alien am. abduction film the fourth kind uh you know communion fire in the sky type fans this is definitely more your vein so or unsolved mysteries mm. the big ben Solved x files mysteries. yeah go there oh uh, fringe maybe yeah. No, there's no yeah, aliens yeah, yeah, yeah. Monsters. We'll go there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I haven't seen as far as you, so let's not talk about it. There's no I don't want aliens, you to give it. Shut so up. Just well. shut up. You're giving away things. I'll uh, beat you. <laughs> that being said, you know, join us next time for our DVD rundown for the week of February 26th, mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. one in February. And as always, you can find us at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com slash MacGuffinCast, mm -hmm. Facebook.com slash MacGuffinPodcast. Yes. Phone number, 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Blip.tv, Miro, Roku. Check in at Get Glue. If you're going to be in the Seattle area on February 28th, we got our next secret movie night coming Good up. Good call. Yeah. Check the uh, Facebook for information. Uh, it's $5, no fees. Yeah, five whole dollars. And we're going to be pre-funking beforehand. Oh, yeah. And right. probably post-funking. Uh, Pre-funk at the Rat and Raven, yep. starting at 6 p.m., I believe. Yep. Screening begins at 9 p.m. at the Grand Illusion. Grand Illusion, so. got to love them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Magneto can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the side of style. Mr. Spock can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. The board can't stop me, I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels alright.